Good afternoon, my name is Lisa Borgsdorf, and I'm the Associate Director for Public Experience and Learning here at UMA, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here today for Making Art in Prison, Survival and Resistance with artists Jeannie Paul and Q and Danny Valentine. Um, this event is presented in collaboration with the Penny Stamp Speaker Series and um, in connection with the Arts and Resistance theme semester on the occasion of Janie's recent book, recently published book, Making Art in Prison, Survival and Resistance. Many of you are already aware of Janie's incredible work through the Prison Creative Arts Project. When Uma conceived of the Arts and Resistance theme semester, it was really a no-brainer to ask Janie to uh, excuse me, for the opportunity to feature her work and the work of these artists. Um, it's also sort of a full circle moment for me personally. I met Janie sh shortly after I started working at the University of Michigan, which we figured out was like 20 something years ago, and learned about um, PCAP. And so it's just really exciting for me to be able to do this with you at this you know, exciting moment with the book. Um, so thank you. Um, some additional thank yous tonight. We have a lot of supporters and collaborators. So in addition to the Penny Stamp Speaker Series, the program is presented in partnership with Janie Paul, the Prison Creative Arts Project, the Stamp School of Art and Design, and the theme semester with the support of the U of M Office of the Provost, the College of Literature, Arts, and Science, and Lizzie and Jonathan Tisch, Erica Gervais, Papendick and Ted Papendick. So I'm going to tell you about the format that we're um, for the afternoon. Um, when I'm done, Janie will come up and give a short presentation on her work, and then she will be joined here in center stage with Q and Danny Valentine to have a conversation about their work. There will be time at the end for a Q&A. We ask everyone to stay until the end of the Q&A. Um, and last, but certainly not least, Janie will be signing books upstairs after the event. The books are um, for sale in the UMA store, so you can get a copy and have it signed. Um, let me say just a little bit about Janie, and then I'll get out of here so she can come up. Um, Janie Paul is co-founder of the Annual Exhibition of Artists in Michigan Prisons, a project of the Prison Creative Arts Project. She's a painter, curator, writer, and an Arthur F. Thurnau Professor Emerita of the Stamp School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. For 27 years, she has traveled throughout Michigan to meet artists and select work for the project she co-founded, the Annual Exhibitions of Artists in Michigan Prisons. In Making Art in Prison, Survival and Resistance, in her book, Janie Paul introduces readers to the culture and aesthetics of pr prison art communities featuring over 200 images of extraordinary work. And if you haven't seen the book, I really encourage you to. The images are incredible. These powerful stories and images upend the manufactured stereotypes of those living in prison, imparting a real human dimension, a real critical step in the movement to end mass incarceration. So with that, I welcome, please join me in welcoming Janie Paul to the stage. Hello? Yeah. Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Lisa, and thank you all for coming. I'm really happy that you're all here and that we have a chance to talk. Um, I'm also really glad to be doing this talk at the museum, an art museum, which has this fabulous exhibit going on of, of the uh, black potters of Old Edgefield, North Carolina. And these were enslaved people who made ceram beautiful ceramic pieces while they were enslaved. And so there's a resonance here because this is another group of people who made beautiful work under severe oppression. Um, their art, like most art in museums, speaks to us from another age, another era, and it's one way we learn about those eras. The work I'm gonna be showing you today 
is work that's from another country in the same time. And that country is the country of incarceration in the United States. So all of the images from, that I'm going to be showing you are from the, um, these art exhibits that, that Lisa told you about. By, uh, and they're all by incarcerated artists in Michigan. And I'm going to go through these images and be talking at the same time and looking at my notes as well. So in Michigan, our art is flourishing because of these exhibits, but art is really going on all over the country in prisons. Now, um, Rafael de Jesus, who did this painting, sold 12 ounces of cocaine when he was in his early 20s in the state of Michigan, even though he was from the Bronx. And he was sentenced to 20, to three consecutive 20-year sentences, 60 years at age 25, with no prior uh, record at all. In this painting, uh, he stands right at the intersection of our world and his, with men behind him going on about their business and their daily life, and he's looking out at us as if to say, here we are. What are you doing about it? And to say, De Jesus' story is one of thousands and millions of people who are incarcerated in our country. The United States is the most incarcerating country in the world, with 25% of the world's prisoners in our prisons. Until very recently, we were the only country that imprisoned for life children under the age of 18. And our criminal legal system is particularly targeted at black and brown people with a disproportionate number of people of color in prisons. Women are the fastest growing group of prisoners and have been for a while. Now, I'm making a lot of statements here which could be followed up by a lot of questions and, and, and more facts, but I only have 15 or 20 minutes, so you know, I'm, I'm kind of going through. And if you have more questions, you know, let me know at the end. I do want to say that many of these artists were not artists before they came to prison. Carmen Valentine, for an example, was a construction worker and carpenter, and she had never made art before she made this painting. Samantha Bashinsky made this wedding dress. She's a lifer. She's in prison for life. Um, she is in her 30s. She came in when she was 20. Um, and I want to play an audio recording I have of her talking about making this wedding dress. Sitting with this one lady, she's an older lady, kind of harsh. And I looked at her, she's sitting there crocheting something, and I, said, I told her, I said, I would never be caught dead doing something like that. She stood up, she says, you think so, kid? Within that week, she had me crocheting. People tend to look at me like I'm a little rough around the edges because I'm into heavy metal and all that type of stuff. But I have a soft side, too. I like girly stuff and flowers. So it just kind of proved to myself that I could do it. I think it was just the fact that I was able to accomplish something with my own hands. And... You know, there's so much that so many people take for granted with their hands that I can't. Because I have MS, I never know when my hands are going to do something weird and I won't be able to do something. You know, the wedding dress in the end is kind of bittersweet at this moment, you know, because it's a beautiful piece of artwork and I'm so proud of it. But being in here, I know I'm not going to get to do one of the two things I want to do with my life. I'm not going to be able to get married. I'm not going to be able to be a mom because I'm in here. And I remember that dream now, and it, it's rough, you know, being told that nobody loves you, nobody cares about you, you're never going to be with anyone, you're never going to get married, you're never going to experience those little dreams that most people have. And it was all taken away from me by him. 
So it's it's hard, you know. Torture is not uncommon in prisons. This is called Five Point, where someone is uh, restrained, and you can see that this prisoner is in their cell, and you can see how they've been walking back and forth on that part of the um, ground. It's inhuman, and um, until recently, women were shackled during pregnancy, and in some places they, they still are. But the real torture is to, to not have a future, to, um, to be sentenced to life in prison, and know that you're going to be there for the rest of your life. Or a very long sentence, like Rafael de Jesus' sentence. Um, Yusuf Qualzell Q is going to talk about this painting later. And this painting called Confiscated Goods really gets at the way that the prison system treats prisoners. And Michelle Alexander uh, made the point that while uh, in, during the Jim Crow era, prisoners were round, um, black people were rounded up from street corners after emancipation and for you know charged with crimes of loitering and, and put in prison, and they were used for labor on chain gangs. Uh, now, that's changed, and although there is prison labor, prisoners are really kind of contained as surplus value in our era of capitalism. And he really gets that point across with this painting. So my husband, Buzz Alexander, and I um, were learning about all this, about mass incarceration in the United States, and we really wanted to do something about it. He had founded PCAP in 1990 when he started going into prisons to do theater workshops. I moved to Michigan and started going in to do arts, art workshops, and um, we decided to do a show of Art by Michigan Prisoners, and that was 1996, the first show. And we went to 16 prisons and showed about 50 pieces. Now we're in our 29th year, and we exhibit over 800 pieces by about 500 artists. So this exhibit has really um, flourished and and made the arts flourish in Michigan prisoners, in Michigan prisons. Um, somebody said, a friend of mine said, um, you know, the, the incarcerated population in the United States is, is one of the biggest populations where art is happening in our country. So this is a, a drawing by Dwayne Montney of what a selection visit looks like. What we do is we go around and we visit all the prisons and we select art. And it's a very social time. Um, it's a very friendly time and it's unusual in prisons that prisoners can get to associate freely with people from the outside. And here he's depicted us um, looking at work by people. So how does art happen in prisons? I think Hugh and Danny will talk a little bit more about this later. But um, there are three commercial genres in prison that allow people to make money. And those are making greeting cards, making portraits, and making tattoos. So you may mentor, you may get a mentor an apprentice to someone who already knows how to do this and learn how to make greeting cards with nice shading and flowers, et cetera. And you can make money by selling these or bartering them for, for store goods. Somebody might come to me as an artist in prison and bring me um, a photograph of their loved one. I make a drawing or a painting and they may send it home to that person. I once asked one of the artists why a drawing or a painting is better than the photograph, and they said because they want to see that you see what they see in that person. They want to make it more personal. And then tattooing goes on all the time, even though it's actually not legal. Um, but all of these three genres have to do with, with relationships and maintaining ties to family and friends by sending things home and by being generous and giving gifts maintains very important ties with people, 
whether it's cards or portraits. And tattoos also signify identification with a group or with um, uh, identity. So they all have to do with belonging and community. <clears throat> so with the aid of the exhibitions, and even without it before that, many people turn from the commercial ventures to making more personal and expressive works. And for example, this is a painting by Gerard Brown. And as he got closer and closer to his release, he, um, he started making paintings of his neighborhood. So as I looked at all this work, when I was starting to write my book, I looked at the intensity of all the work. And a question that had been with me since the very beginning was why is all this work so intense, whether it's from a very, you know, a beginner or a very experienced, skilled artist. And one of the things I realized was that underneath all of this, people are depicting unmet needs, needs that go unmet in prison. So for example, artists are resisting displacement by creating images of home and community. They resist tedium with mystery and humor. They resist being a number with images of identity. Do you see those faces in Oprah's dress? They resist separation from loved ones with images of, home, of love and affection. They resist apathy with critiques of our culture. We can also look at the perceptual and material processes of art making to see why they are so significant. And as an artist, this is something that I am particularly interested in, is not just the subject matter and the content of work, but the processes. And I just had a hunch that in those very basic processes, there's something that's really significant for people who, incar who are incarcerated. So for example, the creation of light and shade is really important. You can imagine how important light is in a prison. So the ability, uh, like Kevin Babcock's um, drawing, where he carefully shaded that tree and used all those different tones and created volume, the creation of the illusion of volume is so important, just with the simplest of tools. The creation of texture is also really important because all the surfaces that surround you in prison are generally made of steel, concrete, plastic, none of the kinds of textures that when you're in the outside world have stories behind them, like our favorite blanket or fabric we bought in a foreign country or a shirt that we got because we like the texture of it. So creating texture is extremely important. This is a, draw, a colored pencil drawing on black paper by Billy Brown, who invented his own visual language. And this is something that I want to emphasize here too, is that the creation of a visual language is what sets an artist's work apart. It's not how much skill they have, how much technical skill they have, it's whether they've created their own technical, their own visual language. So Billy, for example, in this drawing, every single stroke begins with a lighter pressure and then gets darker at the top of the stroke. And he kept that discipline up through the whole drawing and left the black areas to come through. And he did many, many drawings like this. So this was his visual language. Um, whoops. Yep, that's the one I wanted. Um, this is another example of someone who used a visual language. Uh, language, their own visual language. Now, art students, I know there's a lot of you here, you're in drawing classes and you know that that figure isn't done by somebody who's taken a figure drawing class, probably, and that the perspective of the table is wrong. But this man created his own visual language. First of all, he used orange and blue, which are the uh, prison uniform colors. He outlined everything in the, every form is outlined. So that's one of his 
um, vocabulary pieces of his language. He um, set all the items on the table, which are items of addiction. There, none of them are touching each other, whereas in the painting above of it, which is very joyous, all the forms are touching. And so I don't know how conscious that he was of this, but it's this ability to create a visual language and consistency within the work that makes the work strong. And what are, the most important thing I want to say about this is that it's a way of creating uniqueness. I am unique. I invented my own visual language. This is me. This is how I make this. This is what I thought up. This is in direct opposition and direct resistance to the forces of incarceration. So I want to read a passage from my book where I talk about why, um, what happens in the art making process. Incarcerated people make their art in small crowded spaces, often with other people around. They must learn to cultivate an intense relationship with their work to sustain the feeling of being in an intimate relationship to something that matters. Once an artist makes the first mark or makes the first move on a piece of wood or soap or plaster, they engage in an ongoing interaction with the art object. Responses to the physical result of these interactions can be a range of feelings such as joy, anger, boredom, curiosity, frustration, or contentment. This process process affords a continuous range of emotional states that are entirely private, sometimes conscious, sometimes unconscious, flowing in and around the artist. This is intensely satisfying. The art object begins as the recipient of the artist's actions and gradually takes on a separate identity that eventually says, I'm done. This vital back and forth of action and response as a way of being in true and intimate relationship, something that is rare among humans living in prison. Oops, wait a second. Sorry. Okay, um, so there is some, besides that, there's some very deep ways in which people are resisting their situation that have to do with asserting their humanity. So first of all, instead of being known as a number, they're asserting their own unique identity. Alan Campo was Native American, and he took his, um, what do you call the picture that you that's taken of you in prison? Your mugshot, yeah. He took his mugshot and put these feathers in it and transformed it into his own self-portrait. They make themselves visible instead of invisible. And I want to say in terms of invisibility, there are prisons all around here, right around us. There's, there's uh, women's here on Valley and Ypsilanti, and there are many prisons within an hour or two hours. But for most of us, unless you have a family member or a, or a family member who's a guard or a family member who's a prisoner, we're very, you know, we, we just don't think about them. But they're out there, they're, they're, and this makes them visible. And they create meaningful labor in place, in place of meaningless labor. This is a piece by Susan Brown, and she does beadwork. And she has sent thousands and thousands of beads. And um, it takes her hours and hours to do this work. This is a maze that she made that actually works. Um, and so people have prison jobs that, um, you know, like sweeping the floors or you might have an interesting job like working in the law library, but for the most part, the labor, you're working for the prison, and prisons are making money off of you. So artwork is a way to create meaningful labor. And in our exhibitions, people are able to sell their work and get the money. So 
that's very meaningful for people. And um, very importantly, people turn waste materials into tremendous value. So this is a piece by Robert Sarber that he made out of toilet paper, glue, and acrylic paint. And many people make wonderful three-dimensional objects out of um, soap, toilet paper, um, anything that's found, cardboard from boxes. And like Samantha, I think this is a great example. She turned her grief into generosity. She really wanted this wedding dress to be sold and worn by someone who would really enjoy it. And most importantly, they moved from being an object who was caged and moved around and punished to being a subject who has a meaningful relationship with a cherished object. And in this realm, they open up all kinds of choice. And now I wanna ask the question, why is this so important for us to know about? And I'm gonna read a little bit from my conclusion. In his essay, Meanwhile, John Berger tells us that he searched for and found a landmark for our time in history. He chooses prison, positing that most of us are confined by the dominating forces of global financial markets and the governments that carry out their will, along with the surveillance mechanisms they create. Some more, some less, of course, with incarcerated people, refugees, minimum wage laborers, homeless, and very poor people on the extreme end of the spectrum. Twelve years after he wrote this, our world is increasingly dominated by cyberspace and global financial markets. These forces have decreased privacy and increased surveillance. Local enterprises, customs, technology, and environments have disappeared and been replaced with corporate ones. People across the globe suffer from low wages, long work, long work hours, harsh working conditions, restrictive immigration policies, and unemployment. Even high wage earners are restricted by increased work demands and the fears of a limited job market. Most of us, some more and some less, are under the domination of these invisible market forces, which are wielded by those so removed from the lives of people on the ground that most of them become indifferent to the suffering and loss they have caused. Surveillance has become commonplace in our, er, er, in our era. It began as a method of control with the panopticon design of prisons in the 18th century and so forth. So what I'm saying is prisoners are at the extreme end of surveillance and domination, but in a sense where we're experiencing that the, especially those of us who are older and have seen the change coming over a long period of time, and a lot of time we don't think about this. But I think it's very important for all of us not only to see this work and to bring it out into the world to help um, incarcerated artists, but to give, our, to give us inspiration and lessons about resilience. Thank you. Okay, Danny and Q, do you want to come up here? Okay, how are we doing, everybody? Good? Hello, hello. <laughs> students out there? Penny Stamp students. Yay, raise your hand. How's it going? Yeah? Is this stuff that you already knew, or is it new to you? Different responses, huh? Okay. There's a lot more to say, but we want to hear from these guys. So, oh, my remote. I have to get the remote so I can. Where is the remote? Oh, here it is. Okay. Oh, I'm going backwards. Oops. Sorry, guys.
Is Kevin here? Okay, hold on. Kevin, <laughs> you have to help me with the remote. I want to go to. Yeah, but it's not going back. I want to go to the end of the show. Um, okay. You know which? Side? Yeah, keep going. Okay, start here. This one? Yeah. And then to forward. Just hit right. Okay, all right. But you gotta kind of, kind of point it up here. Oh, I have to point it there. Sort of. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, everybody, uh, this is Q. <coughs> this is Danny. <laughs> Both of them have been in our shows, uh, our artists. And um, we're just going to kind of talk informally here. I'm going to ask both of you first to talk about these pieces. I am showing three pieces by each of them. Um, You'll have to just, you, you know what they are. Um, Q, I'll start with you. Um, if you could just tell us something about each piece and then also tell us about the conditions in which you made the work, like where did you do it, how did you get your supplies, um, and, and, and talk about the work as well. And I'll just um, click forward. So you can start with this one. So this piece is called Removed from the Streets. This piece, I was actually in prison. I was having a conversation with a younger guy. And at the time, they had these programs on TV, like Black Swan, where they were doing uh, makeovers of people who didn't really like themselves physically. And they would give them makeovers and give them surgery for, you know, to change their appearance. And the conversation with me and the younger guy was about he had gotten in trouble for the second time. And he was talking about going home and doing the same thing that he had gotten in trouble for the first two times. And I was sitting there on my bunk and I thought about that. Like, what if they were able to remove that from him, that thought process? He had said, uh, the streets is just in me, man. It's just in me. And that kind of resonated. Like, I, I can remember thinking like that. The change hadn't come yet. So I thought about that. Like, what if they could remove the streets from individuals who thought that that's all that they had inside of them? That's where that concept came from. Uh, so I sat on my bunk with a piece of tag board about that big. And I sat there and I drew that piece. Life means death. Um, in 1995, I was convicted of murder and I was sent to prison for life. And how old were you? I was 16 years old. Um, they told me that I would die in prison. Um, so when I first hit the prison yard and it started to hit me when I started seeing people walking around who were old and decrepit, I was fresh face, I didn't have any hair on my face, I was small, and I saw these people moving around and I'm like, man, they, they telling me that that's gonna be me. Not life, but actually death. Because, you know, inevitably it was supposed to be until I died. But I came home June 1st after 28 years. Oops. Oops. There's supposed to be another one here. There was one right before that one. Okay. So this is called the dance of recidivism. Um, that concept was just because I was at a facility where I saw people coming in and going and coming in and going. And I actually saw quite a few people come back in 
and leave while I was still there. Uh, the figure in the middle, that, was, that used to be my prison number. And while I was fighting to get out, I continued to see people come back in and they were talking about the program and that they had in prisons that would help prevent you from, from coming back. But, you know, it's, that was, you know, it, it didn't really exist. If change was to be made, you had to make it on your own because their programming just didn't work. They tell you, you know, at the last minute when you're about to go home, you have to attend this class. Yeah, but that class won't help me. I'm telling you it won't help me. You know it won't help me. But to say that I did something, you put me in it. And then you send me home, and I have no skill. I have no marketable skill at all. And so I come back. And that's what that, that's what that piece is. Thank you. I think we'll go on to talk about Danny's three pieces, and then we'll go on from there. Mm -hmm. I keep forgetting that I have to. OK. So Danny, tell us about your pieces. I, I do want to make the point that uh, one of the reasons I had these two gentlemen here, both really great artists and um, really great and and in different ways and resisted in different ways. Q a lot through the subject matter and the power of his, his work and, and Danny a lot through the extreme um, technical prowess and the, the, the discipline and the desire to bring beauty into the world. So there, I wanted you to see how two very different artists could, could be very powerful in two different ways. You want to talk about why yeah, all, pencil and all of my pieces were um, trial and error. I was learning, self-taught, so everything that I did was, it was just an effort to, my, my thing was to create photorealism with colored pencils. Uh, and I didn't, I had to teach myself, so um, you had all the time in the world to do it, and uh, these, this is, kind of what become of that. Uh, I chose colored pencils because they're very portable. You didn't need to set up your paints. You didn't need to tear down your paints, no brush wash. You just pick them up, use them, put them back. And they were also very easy to transport um, from prison to prison. You know, they put you on these transfers all the time. They're always transferring you around, especially me. Um, I was always resisting and um, resisting the system and the oppression and the slavery and everything else that was going on, uh, random double selling and, and everything. Uh, so that's why pencil, color pencils were beneficial for me in the way that I did my time. Oops. Sorry. Um, do you want to talk oh, about... Uh, stereotypes. This picture is called Stereotypes. I did a whole series. Um, the reason that I did it uh, was to... The, 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 the title Stereotypes was to show that this is what we're told in our society is that blue is, is macho and pink is feminine and... and um, that if you're a man, you have to be, you know, you have to subscribe to the blue thing. You have to paint the baby's room blue. If it's a girl, you got to paint it pink. Um, and that was just my way of being able to show people that it's the title more than the picture. Uh, the title stereotypes is that these are things that were branded upon us, and this was what that was showing. And I'd like you to just describe how, what you did with your colored pencils, because I think oh. it's, uh, it, it's just uh, really fascinating and an example of ingenuity and, and care. Uh, well, they would, you could only, you know, when you ordered supplies, you, could, uh, you couldn't order everything you needed. And, uh, or, or, you know, if you, if you used a lot of... Um, black or white or gray or whatever colors you used a lot of, you, you would buy a bunch of them. Um, and so you're only giving, given a footlocker to, uh, or a duffel bag to put all your 
property, your prisoner property has to fit in there, no matter what. It all has to fit in there or you can't, you can't have it. And so I would split the wood on all my pencils and I'd peel the wood off, use my teeth to pull the lead out. Um, and because they, I could store more in a smaller uh, amount of time. And the leads, having them out of the, 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 the wood themselves, you know, when you use a pencil, you usually sharpen it down to about that far. But that much lead, there's that much lead that gets thrown away. And so I just made a lead holder out of a, a big pen and I took the ink barrel out and the pencil leads would slide right in and I used toilet paper to cinch them up. Uh, it allowed me to use every bit of the pencil. It was more efficient. Um, it was a better system. I think that's a great example of how ingenious people got. <laughs> I know you know, too. <laughs> okay, Danny has one more piece here. Oh. <laughs> um, that was a piece that I did in the hole. The hole was uh, it's segregation. It's where you're stripped of everything. You don't get no art supplies. You don't get uh, no clothing. You, you know, you get a jumpsuit that they put you in. Um, and I'm just, I had the, the, the creative spirit was in me. Um, anybody that has the creative spirit, they will produce something. They will create somehow, some way. And that's what that was. Uh, I use toilet paper. Can. I use, they give you these little bars of green soap and, and you go into the shower and you wash one time with them. <laughs> And then they'd, people would discard them half used and throw them away. And I seen it as an opportunity to uh, gather some pliable sculpture material, if you will. And so I did, I brought them all back to my cell in the hole there. And I'd put them in a little styrofoam cup, soak them in water, bust it all down, make a paste. And I made my own paper mache with uh, toilet paper. I would chew it up and create a batch of that to just start adding bulk, you know, mass. And um, uh, the guards were so impressed that they let me finish it. Uh, you were not supposed to have, do this kind of stuff in the, in the hole. So, but they, they let me do it because they, I didn't give them any problems. And, and when I got out of the hole, I uh, finished it with cardboard, Elmer's glue. Um, Tell about the cardboard. What did you use the cardboard for? The cardboard I used like for the scales on the back fin. I, I took a single hole paper punch and would punch the uh, punch a bunch of hole or uh, the rich cracker box of that cardboard. I just and then I just glued them on there, overlapped them, um, hundreds of them. And um, I also used cardboard on the base. Um, and obviously on the sides, there's that paper mache on the sides and just kept creating uh, bulk and mass. And that thing turned out to be four foot long and um, it turned out okay, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> this is a, you know, this is really outstanding, this piece, but there's so many people inside who make incredible work out of material that is um, discarded, and that's what I, the point I was making earlier about turning waste into value. Absolutely, yeah. That became my thing after that was to, whatever I could find that was garbage and that people didn't want and they'd throw away, I took it and I'd bring it back to my cell and I'd stare at it for a couple of days and start making something out of it. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll move ahead to talking about PCAP and how that the show um, impacted you, I guess, you know, what your relationship, what it did for you. So for me, uh, it was 2006 when I first Whoops. did a piece for uh, PCAP. Uh, I was introduced to PCAP because I used to do portraits. Um, I didn't have a lot of money coming in from outside, so to support myself, I, I did portraits, I drew tattoos, um, I did cards, uh, uh, greeting cards, uh, holiday cards, and then somebody that I knew who I used to sit down and, and draw with, he told me about PCAP, 
and he asked me had I ever submitted something. And I'm like, nah, you know, I don't know who they are. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. But then I, he convinced me. And I did a piece and I submitted it. But the piece that I did, I didn't think that it would be taken in. I didn't think that they would take it because it was just an interpretation of a thought that I had. When I saw that I didn't need to explain what it was, I was like, wow. And they actually took that piece. That was the first time I saw somebody cry over a piece that I did. And it kind of blew me away. And I was like, wow. So from 2006 until 2021, I submitted pieces every year. Uh, and I, I told a different story about my journey every year from 2006 to 2021. Yeah, thank you. Danny, what about you? Uh, well, PCAP saved my life. I mean, literally saved my life. Um, I was the product of uh, a wrongful conviction and a corrupt um, judicial system. And I got sent in and, you know, they gave me 30 years and I, um, yeah, my family abandoned me. It just I was out all alone on my own, and, and yeah, I just I gave up. Um, I, I just take the easy way out. I was I made plans to uh, commit suicide, and and I was going to jump over the gallery. And it, during the time that they they uh, when they break the jo doors for Chow is is mass movement. And but before that, while they take a count, they do a head count. That's when they pass out evening mail, and um, Buzz Alexander, the the uh, founder of uh, PCAP, uh, they he had sent me a letter inviting me to do the very first show. This this was back in '96, and um, the letter came in my my room through the bars. I threw it in the bars, and um, I opened it, and uh, it. Uh, breathe new life into me. And you did the shows every, every year since then? Every year, yeah, I did the show every year uh, as a paying homage to this man who invited me uh, the very first time and saved my life, literally. I'm gonna just continue here for a minute because there's a segue here into the next thing, that uh, next topic, which was is um, about how you both used your imagination to resist incarceration. And I'm gonna stick with Danny here because this, what he was just talking about relates to, um, relates to this, which is um, how you resisted double bunking, ended up going into the Bam Bam Room, which you'll, he will explain what it is and used your imagination to survive there. Um, so if you could tell that in not yeah, I, too long a time, because we're okay, going to start. I, um, they would random double sell people um, without any, any uh, classification system to determine compatibility or whatnot. And they actually made it a, a pastime of theirs, an amusement of theirs to put a, a predator in with a prey and watch, just watch how it turned out. And um, that happened to me. Um, a guy actually killed me. I mean, snapped my neck and then choked me out and drug me under the bunk and they had to revive me. At that point there, I, I, I refused to double bunk. And so their, their uh, solution was, um, you know, we'll put you in the hole. And I said, thank you. And the hole is, you know, segregation, you get nothing. Uh, but I couldn't come and go out of the hall that way. When you're in there on punitive, um, they tell you when you can leave. And then I learned that the Bam Bam Room, which is a suicide room, um, you can come and go. That room is worse than the hall. In fact, it's the worst place you can possibly be in a prison system. And um, But it allowed me to come and go. And I would. that's why I, I did the last 15 years of my sentence was that way because... I had to do the show. I, I wanted to do the show every year, and so that allowed me to go in there, come back out when I needed to do the show, and go right back in. Um, but you, you can't, if you don't have some kind of method of surviving that, you, you won't. It, it, it'll wear you down. It'll just break you. 
Uh, it's a room that's, you're given a tarp, a, a, a nylon tarp that's abrasive and causes rashes on you, and you, you lay on a concrete slab, and the lights are so bright, they keep them on 24 hours a day. I mean, they're so bright, they could peel paint. Uh, and they keep it cold, and you're freezing, and, and they do it to torture you because they want you to come out of there because as long as you're in there, you're a liability to them. And um, I just... I refused to, to, to be broken, and, and the way I did it was to uh, meditate. I learned to um, create a world inside my head. I put myself literally in the place I wanted to be, in the climate that, uh, I mean, I imagined everything, um, the, the changing of seasons, the conversations I would have with people. I'd build my house in real time. I'd slow it down, I'd put each brick the mortar on it, set it on there, tap it down, level it out, and months would go by that way. But it also gave me power over them uh, because it drove them nuts that how is this guy lasting for months and years in this, in this room, in these conditions? And that's how I did it. Um, it was the toughest thing I ever did. But once you learn to use your creative mind you can overcome anything. I mean, this is stuff they taught the Vietnam vets uh, or war vets to, to um, endure pain and cold and weather conditions, and it really does work. <laughs> I can attest you to it. You said that you uh, actually could change your temperature by imagining that you I were could. I, I, I literally imagined every single detail and aspect of the climate. Um, okay. <laughs> I wanted to be in an 80 degree climate, so in my head I ma manufactured that, and, and I was not cold. It's just hard to explain it, but when you want something bad enough and you can visualize it hard enough and long enough, it, it becomes reality. Yeah, well that, that's amazing, and I wanted, I wanted you all to hear that story. And now I want to turn to, to Q and, and have him tell us about how he used his imaginative capacities in a very different way. And, just from talking together, what struck me was the subject matter, your, your intelligence and the subject matter of your work and how you told me about kind of hiding, in a way, the, the subject matter, but also your moral integrity and the decisions that you made going in at a very young age on how you would lead your life. Yeah, for me, it was, it was quite different. Um, because I went in at so such a young age, um, I had to teach myself how to be a man. I mean, I went in, I was 16. Um, there are a lot of stories in that, but there are a lot of stories that the administration for the Department of Corrections, they don't want to be told. Um, they don't want to tell how at, at 17, I was thrown in with grown men. They don't want me talking about that. They don't want me to create things or write things that would show how they're doing something wrong. So when I really had the opportunity to deal with PCAP and I saw like, man, I can actually tell my story even beyond the censorship. I can find ways to be creative and tell my story without them being able to censor me. So that was a, a way for me to, to create a space of my own that they couldn't, that wasn't theirs. It was mine, that creative space was mine. The things that I put on canvas and on paper, I created that. I was able to manifest it and some things they, they caught. I'm not gonna lie, some things they caught, but sometimes I was slicker than them. You know, I was able to get, I mean, look, this piece is on here right now. I did this a few years ago, and all of you are seeing it. And everybody who went to the PCAP show saw it. And when it was online, people saw it. The story is there are still people who are, you know, uh, who went in at such a young age, and they're told to die in prison. Um, it's not a topic that a lot of people want to talk about. It's not a topic that a lot of people truly understand because people say, oh, well, you hurt somebody and 
But what were you doing at 16? Were all of your decisions right? Well, if, if you were asked to make those decisions today, would they be the same decisions? Well, how do you tell that story without being punished for trying to tell that story? Because you can be punished for trying to tell that story from inside. Through my art was the way that I, I found out how I could do it. Mm -hmm. So over all of those years, that was my process. How do I tell a part of my story through my art. Mm -hmm. This gave me the platform to do it. So the same way Danny said that PCAP kind of saved him, this was therapeutic for me. Because if you let that pain and everything that you experience and fester inside of yourself, it does something to you. I allowed my artwork to help me. I allowed it to get out. People go to therapy and they pay a lot of money. Well, I was in a place where I couldn't go to therapy like that. They don't have that. So mentally, I was responsible to take care of my own self. And this is how I did it, through, through my artwork. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to say, but I think we're at the time where we should close this conversation and invite those of you in the audience to ask questions or make comments. We'd love to hear from you. And there are microphones. Because there's so much that, um, <laughs> there's so much left unsaid. I do want to clarify something about life without parole. That was the law in the United States, but there, the, the uh, Supreme Court did rule that that's unconstitutional several years ago. I don't for know. mandatory life without for parole. For mandatory life without so parole. So now they have to do a, what they call a Miller hearing, and there are contributing factors to everything, but. <laughs> As a juvenile, you can still be sentenced to life without parole, but you have to go through a different type of hearing. But people like you are being resentenced now. Um, so that's how he got out and other people are getting out is that they're, they're coming up for resentencing. Can I add to, um, it's amazing what what this man overcome going in at the age that he came, came in at and went through what he went through to come out. And he's a success story. It's, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Yes. You have a, right here? You yeah, have a question. Mm-hmm. Do you want to, would, would you either of you like to answer that? Would you like to answer that question? Uh, I'll try to be brief, but it's, it's hard for society to imagine a system that prison doesn't exist because prison is so profitable. But prison don't work in the way that you think it works. That's how come the recidivism rate usually is what it is. Because it's not, it's a punitive system, but it doesn't prevent things from happening. If you tell me to go in prison for the rest of my life for watching something happen, not for actually participating, for not stopping an individual for doing what he do, how does that protect society? So now you're spending thirty-three dollars to $43,000 for me a year to do what? This money that can be spent on so many different things. So as valid as your question is, this would have to be done with the brain trust of society. What else can we think of besides this system that we know doesn't work? Prisons just don't work. So. Yes, back there. For the first uh, drawing that you showed, it, it was very light in the way that it was drawn. Is there a specific reason that you drew it that way? Or uh, like what, what were you thinking about in terms of value when you were like drawing it? Uh, so <laughs> one of the things that I, I started to do, 
somebody who actually taught me. His name was Raymond Gray, Free Ray Gray. He, uh, he actually taught me. One of the things he used to say was, hey, man, stop being scared of the dark. <laughs> That's just how he used to say it. Stop being scared of the dark. And I didn't understand exactly what he meant, but so I have a I have an issue with my hand, right? Oops. So when I would okay. when I would draw, uh, I didn't I didn't put a lot of pressure on the paper. Uh, I could do it, but I just found it uh, easier. So I was taking the easier way out. I didn't, at, at that point when I did that, that was years ago, but at that point, I just wanted to get the idea on paper. It wasn't about the technical aspect because I have other pieces that are technically better than a lot of the stuff that you know, you've know you seen here, but it was more about getting the idea on paper and on canvas than the technical aspect. Like I, I do portraits and they're not like that. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask um, if either of you could talk about maybe how like your art practices change now that you've been released. Um, like if your art feels different or just because you're not restricted with the materials or anything, like what does that feel like? Just tell people. Was that a question for me? It's both of you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I can't hear very. I didn't even hear the question really. Um, I, I was just wondering, um, now that you've been released, um, like how it, has your art practice changed, or does it feel different um, because you're not in the like these days in the exhibition, or you don't have to think about like controlling the materials as much? Can you re re that? I can't hear. Okay, she wants to know if your art practice has changed since you've been out, but you're uh, not making art. It, it has changed because I went blind in my left eye. Um, while I was in, um, and I couldn't get treatment, I couldn't get proper medical care. Um, I quit doing art at that point. Um, uh, which, you know, um, I got out shortly that, after that in uh, 2013. I went blind in my eye in 2010. Um, yeah, it. Uh, I haven't adapted yet. I haven't found a. Um, I don't know. I just haven't found the desire to overcome it yet or adapt. I've taken on other things. Um, yeah. Now I'm behind the lines of PCAP. I help with PCAP with the show and uh, whatever else I can do. Um, for me. So I, I just came home in June. So after 28 years of being inside and going in as a kid, when I came out, there are a lot of things that y'all probably wouldn't even think about because you've done it progressively. I've been trying to get my life moving, and I have, but I haven't actually found a lot of time to do some of the things that I'm going to do. I have been doing tattoos. And I don't have to hide doing it because inside is illegal. Out here, I can do it. So I have been doing tattoos, and that's that's uh that's been pretty cool. Yeah, over here. This is more of like a logistical question, but I know when <clears throat> sorry when we're like coming in to pick the art for the art shows and. Anything that doesn't get sold, we obviously can't send it back inside. Um, so in just in terms of like, and specifically like with your mermaid, Danny, like I guess how, how were you able to like physically like keep that with you as you were transferred to different prisons? Or like how did you guys keep your art with you? And like when you were released, is it just logistically easy to take that with you? Or how does that work, I guess, in I terms of property? Able. I wasn't able to take it with me. In fact, that piece got stolen by a staff member, a, a guard. You know. And if it, if it hadn't been stolen, would you have been able to take it? No, it was too big. I, would have, I had to send it out or do something with it. Um, Most people uh, have to send their art out. You can't, you're not allowed to keep a whole bunch of your art inside. You have to keep sending it out. But if, you, if guards know that you're saving it for the show, Right, you want to explain that? Yeah, so uh, they, if, if 
they'll tell you that it's finished hobby craft. That's what they'll call it. So if they call it finished hobby craft, they won't let you keep it. If it's something that you're preparing for the show, they know that PCAP uh, people are coming in, so they can't take it then. But after PCAP leaves, if you still have it, they found ways to maneuver uh, and, and take quite a bit of art over the years. Uh, unfortunately, not just mine, not just his, but other people's artwork have been, you know, uh, taken. So uh, one strategy is that a lot of the artists will donate work that wasn't selected for the show to us. And then we use that at our auction in December to raise money for the show. Just a couple more questions. Yeah. Question. It's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful, touching thing, and I personally so appreciate it. Well, thank you. Um, for me, there is a, there is a thing uh, inside where if you're an artist, there's a certain level of respect that's given to you because everybody loves art, you know, in, in different ways. Like you say, your husband was a musician. People love music. People love uh, textural art. People love art. So if you're creative, people give you a little more leeway um, about things. Then, I mean, to be honest, I, I've sat in there for so long. I know so many people. It, it, I mean, it is what it is. Truth is truth. If what I said were, were lies, then I would have something to worry about. But truth is truth. Um, in there, I could be censored. You know, the repercussions would be harsh sometimes, but I'm not in there now. So I don't, I'm not concerned so much about what they have to say in there because I'm not in there. So I don't concern myself with that as much now. Well, at all now. Do you want to answer that? Um, well, I, I speak on it because it's just so important that um, people know that don't know. Nobody, uh, a lot of people don't know what's happening. Um, and that the, the art program, um, it just it saves lives and it, it produces uh, good. And like you said, you know, when you're an artist, you have something special. You have, you know, you, you have the ability to elate people's minds, to, to um, you give them a gift. Even if they purchase a piece of artwork from you and spend hard-earned money on it, um, you give them something that brings them joy for as long as they own the piece. Uh, they hang it up in their, their house. Um, when people come over, it's a conversation piece. It, it, it's just over and over they get to talk about it, and you, it's a gift that you give to people. And like you said, that you know, it, you, you're given some leeway, and um, it's a special thing. And to be able to enlighten others is, it's it's just so necessary to, to bring this to the forefront, because it changes lives. I mean, I've seen it. We've all we've seen it. Thank you. Let's just have one more question. Okay. Life is death. Um, I think is very impactful and like it really 
transmits the like a feeling um but i was wondering like what was your thought process kind of like accepting this or seeing this that like kind of like mortality aspect of being in prison and how like how did you accept it or like get through it um very interesting question okay, uh, first. Could um, take an hour to answer that, but yeah, I, we only I, I'll try, <laughs> to, cut it, I'll try to cut it down like, really quick. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it took me seven or eight years to actually accept the fact that they told me to die in prison. Um, it took that long because there were so many other things that I needed to contend with just by being in there. I couldn't focus on that aspect of it because I needed to focus on everything else around me. Excuse me Survivor. if I'm speaking. Yeah. fast, but I want to get it all out. Um, and after that, you know, going in and out of segregation, I had made a decision. I made a decision because I said to myself, if I continue to come back and forth to segregation, if the doors were to open and I were allowed to come home, how would I stay out of prison if I can't even stay out of segregation? So 20 years later, I had never had another misconduct because my mind was set on the doors will open. When? I don't know, but the doors will open. So I never really accepted the fact that I would be there forever because in my mind I was manifesting free. So I never accepted it. And I think that's a big part of why I made it home, you know, when I did, because they could have resentenced me to life. If I would have kept that thought process that I'm going to die in here, then I would have acted like I was going to die in there, which would have meant I would have stayed in segregation. I would have been hurting people. I would have been doing all of the things that prison allows for people to do. And I wouldn't have made it home. I wouldn't have made it home anytime soon anyway. But a decision was made many years ago to see the changes that were needed, manifest those changes, and get my butt home, man. I'm home. Thank you. Thank you all. Great questions. Um, we're, we're done for now. And those of you who would like to get a book and have me sign it or talk to these gentlemen further will be out uh, near the upstairs, near the entrance to the museum. Yeah.